Welcome, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Yeshi. I am the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a network of scientists and activists working to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. We are so excited and thankful that you all braved the weather, travel delays, <laughs> to spend Juneteenth with us. Um, Juneteenth was recognized as a federal holiday officially in 2021. Uh, yes, I found out that it's actually one of the longest running holidays in the history of this country. And I'm so thankful that with this generation, we've seen a resurgence in its celebration. And when I think about Juneteenth, I think about the fact that for two and a half years, enslaved African people were free legally, but had no idea and were gaslit and told that they were still under the system of chattel slavery. And it makes you think, how do we think about freedom today? What does it mean to us? And what is it? And what is the difference between freedom and actual liberation? And that's what we are here to talk about, the ways in which electronic music has been a source of true liberation, spiritually, politically, physically, for black people for a very, very long time. I'll start off by reading our Decompress Manifesto, which you all have seen on the wall. And this is the guiding vision statement for everything that we're doing with this space and how we see this project going forward. Three years since the 2020 uprising, in the wake of, of the 10th anniversary of Trayvon Martin's murder, and 60 years since the Montgomery bus boycott, like many of you, we are burnt out from the fight to, rent, to end racial violence. Today we announce the space to decompress. From a world where prisons are the state's response to the affordable housing crisis, where algorithms decide our futures, and a world where our life expectancy is most correlated to our ability to pay a cost of living, The verb decompress has meaning in everyday language as well as technology. To relieve pressure, to unwind, and the process that a data file must undergo to be used for a purpose. Now more than ever, we need places to unplug and, dis and disconnect from the systems that exploit our attention, energy, and time. We must decompress to find alternatives. We must be able to breathe and envision. Decompress is a DIY, multidisciplinary event space and movement laboratory here in Miami, Florida. Welcome, you're sitting in it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Decompress also serves as the very first headquarters of Data for Black Lives. We've been a, re a remote organization for the last five years. From the beginning, we knew that transforming data from a weapon into an instrument of social change was also culture change. When we say abolish big data or no more data weapons, two of our campaigns, we demand the end of technologies and cultures around them which they are used. Cultures of surveillance, intimidation, and technological aggression. At Data for Black Lives, we believe the only good system is a sound system. We believe in the power of sound and recognize that high vibrational spaces where people can congregate safely are needed right now. We know the powers of dance floors to desegregate and unite. Spaces built by and for community are where new modes of being and new worlds are created. We also know that black people have reinvented pop culture over and over and over again. Yes to that. <laughs> First and foremost, as a method of cultural and spiritual resistance to the status quo. For us, music is a black technology that will overthrow Babylon through sound, data, and collective action. Early Jamaican sound systems were hybrid networks, equally spiritual and technological. 
selectors, promoters, MCs, and community members were united around super amplified, customized systems that played exclusive dub records by Rastafarian artists. The, that's right. <laughs> These messages were delivered at high wattage with wardrobe sized speaker boxes that the community would gather around to hear at venues, to be purged of negative emotions, and be emboldened into a further and greater sense of identity and community. Techno music was invented by the Belleville Three and inherited by black, brown, and queer youth, echoing the great spirit of the African-American freedom movements that had preceded it. Across the world, techno transmits coded single signals expressing an inherent romance and trauma that carries centuries worth of stories. Today, raving continues to be a powerful instrument of social change. August 11, 2023 will mark the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Through the improvisation and experimentation of hardware technologies, young black people in the Bronx response to the political and social conditions of the 80s became a global, multidisciplinary, multi-generational, world-changing movement, and probably the most significant creative force of our time. We decompress so that we can continue to carry this torch forward. At the Data for Black Lives conference in 2019, Valencia Gunder, co-founder of the Freedom Inc. and the Black Collective, predicted what is happening in Miami today. Little Haiti is the highest point in the city and COVID-19 real estate speculation has accelerated the gentrification of this neighborhood. In addition to climate gentrification, the community is fighting a multi-million dollar initiative to transform Little Haiti into the Magic City Innovation Center, which is posed to displace 3,000 households by the year 2030. We believe that it's divine timing that we're grounded here in Little Haiti right now as its future is being decided. By creating a space to decompress culturally, we assert a vision of innovation that recalls contributions of black people to music, to culture, to modern society, and in particular to the building of this very city. From the predominantly black convict laborers who built the Tam Miami Trail, very important history that I encourage everybody to, look, to learn more about, to the political refugees who came from Haiti, a country reeling from the impact of US foreign policy, who came here with nothing and turned this community into the most vibrant cultural hub in Miami, an area that no one else wanted until the rest of the city began to flood. We are here to, here to proclaim that cultural resistance is data resistance. And through the curation of conscious and timely programming, we are extending the invitation for you to continue to come and decompress with us. And it is my great honor that I am able to welcome these panelists today here to come and help bless and christen this space and talk about the role that music has played as a black technology, the oranges of house, the oranges of, of techno, and most importantly, to tell their stories. It is my honor to introduce DJ Heather, who is known as one of the top Chicago artists of all time next to Kanye West. Her work, <laughs> I would say you're better. Your work in shaping house music and bringing it all over the world and continuing to be a trailblazer and torchbearer of the tradition, yes, is so inspiring. And I'm so thankful that you are here to speak and you came all the way from Chicago to join us. Yes, thanks so much. And I've, I've got to live up to all those accolades being here on this panel, so I appreciate that. And um, um, it's my absolute honor to be here to help you bless this space and to be part of this event. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you.
And, I mean, it is without introduction that I introduce Paper Water, Eddie and Deji. You all have put Miami on the map, and you have created a sound that has literally changed the world. Like, when I told people that I know from all over the world that they were playing, people freaked out because of the ways in which your work has totally shifted people's palates, people's taste. It has been, it's multidisciplinary, innovative, bold, and such an incredible clean aesthetic as well. I thank you both so much for holding it down in Miami and continuing, continuing to contribute to the scene here and to really, again, be pioneers in it. So thank you both so much for not only playing twice tonight, but really when you first read the manifesto, reaching out and once I knew that I had your support, I felt like that's really what I needed <laughs> locally. So thank you. This, uh, thank you for having, should we do this at the same time? Like dual, dual vibes? Okay. Um, thank you so much for having us. Uh, this is incredible. I mean, everything that you're doing is as electronic artists that are doing different things and just like black artists that are just figuring out things to just try, you, you're, you have a nonprofit that facilitates, you know, making it okay to like have ideas to do new things and stuff like that. So Miami definitely needs a venue like this. And this is incredible. And thank you everybody for being here. And before Greg gets on the mic, I want to introduce Greg as one of the most illustrious techno house DJs of Miami, a OG in the scene. <laughs> so humble, so nice, and also an industry leader and exec at Avid Pro Tools. We've had lots of conversations about how do we make sure that platforms like Pro Tools continue to support black artists, and Greg is in there every day advocating and making sure that that, that folks have the technology, continue to have the technology that they need to uh, reinvent pop culture over and over and over again. So, Greg, go ahead, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's, thank you. Thank you, Yeshi. Uh, thank you to all of you, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I don't know who that person is you just introduced. I, the only thing I relate to is the OG part because that means I'm old. <laughs> so I'm definitely that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to get right into it and, and talk about a lot of things, you know, from the, the music side of it and the technology side of it. I mean, all of that is just, you know, what you're doing, Yeshi, and how you've brought this all together is extremely, it's essential, it's important. It is, I mean, it's, it's everything that all of us, and I as I look out, I see some of my friends, some of my family members, like, it's, it's all of it. It's all of it. So I, it, this, it, it all culminates into this, into this thing. Uh, which is not just one thing, and I, it's an honor to be here. And yeah, let's let's do this. <laughs> awesome. Well, Greg, I wanted to start with you actually, and talk about how your experience using technology as a young black person, and when you first picked up a synthesizer, what that was like. Well, yeah. So uh, you know, uh, first I'll, I'll go back even a little bit further. So I'm originally, I'm, I'm Jamaican, I'm uh, Chinese, Jamaican Chinese. Uh, yeah, woo. <laughs> um, in your manifesto, yeah, thank you, Judy. My daughter's over there. So now I'm, I'm really nervous because my, seven, my seven-year-old is here. Um, the story, you, like the, the vision or the visual you, you, uh, you wrote around the, the sound systems, I grew up in that. And I started playing piano um, when I was four. Um, classically trained, but it was the weekends, it was the dub, it was getting in the car with my dad at six o'clock every, every Saturday morning and driving from Kingston from the south to the north end of the island uh, to Port Antonio where my dad's family was and getting, driving through every parish and knowing that we were getting close, even if I fell asleep, I knew we were getting close to a parish because I would hear that bass and I would hear it and I knew there was a sound system in my very direct near future and what that just, that uh, that was everything for me. I mean, that is where everything started. And that's technology. And it's musical. It's, it's music, certainly. All the records, all the, you know, the amazing music that was coming out of Jamaica at the time, all the dub, all the reverb and the delay. Nothing else, just reverb and delay. Um, 
And I live on that. I live on that today. I think we all live on that today. Um, and watching how these guys would grab parts, woofers, piezo tweeters, make liner. They were making liner arrays out of wood cabinets and stacking them and stacking them and stacking them. And these guys knew, like, it might have looked, uh, you know, hastily thrown together. It wasn't. There was math going on there. You know, everything, every component, every, we knew what the wattage was, what the impedance was, and what amps were going to drive this set of speakers, where the crossovers were. There was, there was so much math. So it's left and right brain all coming together to create this beautiful thing. That's what I remember as a, as a child. Fast forward, moving to the States, and then I started hearing all this other stuff. Because growing up, it was really just well, classical music, because that's what I was learning as a pianist. Church music, of course, hymns, a lot of organ, a lot of piano. And then uh, moving to the States, you know, drum machines and synthesizers and knowing, asking questions. My uncle uh, played rhythm guitar for Marvin Gaye on tour and uh, gave me my first, well, my first drum machine. Um, and my first synthesizer I bought when I was 14. It was a, a, a red essay, Roland SH-101. At the time, I didn't know what that meant. I knew it made cool sounds, and then I realized very quickly that it was monophonic. I could, it could only press you know, one note at a time. That was, that was heartbreaking, but I learned synthesis there. Fast forward, you know, I mean, technology has just played an essential role in everything we do. Discovering uh, techno uh, when I was in, you know, just about to graduate high school, I mean, that changed my entire life. Then realizing that it was out of Detroit, and then there was Chicago, and there was House, and New York, and there were all these black faces. No idea, had no idea. And it was like I was born again. And I mean, I can continue going on and on and on and on, I don't wanna take up the whole panel, but that's also led me to have the courage, not only to make music, but to get involved in, in you know, music technology and creating technology, making technology for, for everyone, you know? Um, we can get into that, certainly, but I mean, it all, it's all very much uh, interconnected. Okay. Thank you, Greg. How about you, Eddie? What was, what's your experience? What's your journey been? And yeah, I would just like to hear more about your story. Um, I took a different route. Um, I wanna say, I always grew up around music. Uh, my, I was born in Haiti, so there's carnival there, there's, um, Compa, there's Zouk, there's everything that everybody's familiar with here in Miami. And my parents would, um, the, my earliest memory of music was my dad would make us do chores on Saturday and I wasn't allowed to watch cartoons and I was like really upset about that. Like I wasn't allowed to play with my friends, I wasn't allowed to go out, but I had to do chores. But my mom would o open up the sliding glass doors and she would blast like Marvin Gaye, she would blast like all this old school music and that made all the chores like manageable. So my earliest memory of music was like um, consuming all of that and I kind of put off music for a career in like sports and I linked up with Deji. Um, I wanna fast forward the whole story but we, we met in high school and we linked up again after we graduated college and decided to pursue paper water. And he was always a very big um, advocate on me producing. He's like, hey, you have the ear for it. You, you know, you always giving me good advice. Um, he's like, just try it. So after college, I downloaded Ableton. And Ableton um, kind of changed my whole life because of like the entry point and like how easy it was to kind of grasp this whole concept. I kind of feel like uh, for anybody who's used Ableton, it kind of feels like Microsoft Paint. And any idea, yeah, any idea I think of in my head, I could actually like translate into sound. So it's, it's been like a crazy journey as far as like um, figuring out like, all right, what is this like Haitian sample sound over house drums? Or like, what does it sound like on hip hop or like, what does Kanye's acapella sound like on a, on a Haitian uh, compa song? And it's kind of led me to this like explorative, like, um, I don't know, like I feel like I'm just like on this everlasting journey of like 
bending sounds, figuring stuff out, and like trying to break this like matrix that we're in. And like, I mean, what's 16 bars, what's eight bars, or what's this key, or like I'm just, I don't know. I'm just on this ever growing journey of like, trying to break what the standard of music is and like what people dance to and like how to make people dance again. And then I think that's like what I'm on. I feel like people don't dance anymore and I want to make people dance again. And that's where I'm at. Y'all definitely had me dancing earlier, so thank you. And we're gonna dance later. KG. Hello, everybody. Um, my music journey started when I was five. I think at a Costco. Um, there is a, my mom was shopping and there's a piano and I was able to like play by ear and they were like, oh, how, how do you, how does, how long has your son been doing lessons? And she's like, he doesn't do lessons. <laughs> and um, she put me in piano lessons and uh, I'll learn, I learned how to play Mozart and all these things. And then for some reason, I just wanted to like, go off the grid and play my own thing. And um, my journey, I guess, in the music industry or in music, like really doing it as a career, started in uh, high school when I, I got Fruity Loops. And, and uh, it was during the time, I don't know if you guys know Dipset with Cameron and uh, Joel Santana. So they were popping at the time to the point that uh, people in Miami were wearing Tim's and saying they're from New York. <laughs> so, so I was like, how do I do that? How do I do that? He's like, you have to get Fruity Loops. I was like, like the cereal? And they're like, no, it's like a, a beat program. And so I made my first beat and uh, I went to the, the lunchroom table and our school is ruthless. So when, there's a big hallway that you had to walk through to go to the lunchroom table and people would rank on you. They'll just, yeah. so if you had ugly shoes, you just had to hear it going into the lunchroom table. <laughs> so I came with my beat, I played it to Eddie and a couple of my friends and they're like, this is the worst <laughs> beat we ever heard ever right now. You should stick to piano. <laughs> and so I was like, I was hurt, but I went home and kept working at it. and. Um, Eventually, they're like, oh, this is kind of good. And I always felt when it comes to technology, um, you know, black people and so many people are oppressed. But technology, especially like AI, gives you the opportunity to, uh, if you really utilize it, you could like leapfrog a lot of things, you know. Um, it, it, it takes away those walls. And I just, kept at it, and I'm, now I'm an Ableton user. And uh, with everything now, I almost feel like there's no limits and how the world is now with the recession and, um, and music's at a state that is, to me personally, I feel it's like very boring. I feel like technology gives you the opportunity to like really explore and uh, really present something new, which is scary at this point. So um, I don't know if I answered the question, but. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. For thank you for that. So I, I'll make it, try to wrap it up quick for my um, journey. Um, as a kid growing up, originally from New York, but coming to Chicago. So I'm pretty much a Chicagoan, been drinking from the waters of Lake Michigan since I was seven. Um, but my musical journey started with my parents and their influence in having just their record collection. So I just would um, dig into what they had because it was just there, but it wasn't just black music. It was everything folk, you know, dare I say country. Um, but. R&B, soul, everything, and you could tell their tastes were coming together. Um, and then from there, just kind of being into music as a, as a listener. So by the time I got to grade school, I was first introduced to computers um, back in the day when Apple Basic broke out. So that's letting you know how old I am. But that was the first time I was able to program on my own and then getting 
you know, getting hooked up with my own computer, which was basic programming on Atari 500 with a with a membrane keyboard, so you had to press really hard. You know what's up, oh geez, no. So you, did, you had to press really hard to like get any sort of coding going on. And then fast forward to just being a, a kid of the radio, and that was a big part of music culture in Chicago. But a hybrid of all those sounds, those first wave of, of um, punk rock and also hip hop, and new wave all coming together and fusing industrial and being in that in that sort of vortex of all those sounds was really incredible. But I will fast or kind of go back a little bit. What was I always think of it as a really inflection point in how people viewed black music outside of my home was the first time I saw a Demolition Disco on TV. I saw it live, and because you know I was a nerd, only kid like baseball, different teams, because in Chicago, if you root for different teams, it's a whole issue, but no one cares as long as you're a kiddo. So I was watching the Sox game, and they had the break in the game where it was Steve Dahl's Demolition Disco, and it was just basically supposed to be this kind of um, nondescript kind of promotional item or promotional event between games. Um, but what it turned out to be was literally a riot, and him kind of discussing records that he didn't approve of. And these piles of records you could see as they panned the crowd were records that were in my home. And it really scared the, the crap out of me because I didn't understand how someone could hate stuff that I love. It was coming from a place of love. Um, I associated it with Saturdays Clean in the House, um, um, music that just brought me joy. And so from then on, my love of the Chicago White Sox kind of was put on the back burner. And, but I also realized that my bubble was burst in terms of how people viewed black folks, black music as a genre specific thing. Um, and it still kind of haunts me to this day because it was, there was smoke in the field. There was guys with no shirts on and mullets and just kind of degrading something that I love so much. And I really didn't understand it until many years later. And it was almost literally like musical trauma, dare I say. But so fast forward to the journey that I had with working with um, different record labels and um, also starting to produce on my own and also learning the art of DJing because I knew I had the, uh, the mentality of mixing, of programming, but I really needed the skill set. And once I figured that out, once I mixed um, Arrested Development Tennessee instrumentals together, I knew it was over. I knew that was another, <laughs> another step in a direction. But as a Chicago kid, I listened to house, listened to hip hop, and that's what I would play as well. And I would still try to produce on my own. I think my first software I got from Johnny Fiasco, um, which was just like a, a crack of reason. So I installed that on my computer, and it was nice to have like a three-dimensional, um, you know, artificial studio system on a computer. But I also had an MPC as well, so I was learning how to really um, make beats um, in a tactile fashion, in addition to using software. So over time, it was just really about uh, honing my craft and trying to just get better because. It's literally um, trying to set a bar for yourself, but also you don't want anyone you know, talking about you. So you want to have your game on point, because if you're in a, in a city that is well-renowned for DJs, you don't really care about the crowd so much. You care about the DJ that is sitting there critiquing you and watching what you do. But, um, but part of that is also coming from a hip-hop background because there weren't that many female DJs when I was coming up. So I didn't want it there to be any excuse. Um, if there was a problem, I didn't want it to be mine because I was I knew inherently I was representing and I didn't want to, to set a tone that anyone would see me and think of me as not being on point because I wanted to, it always, Everything was about skill. Gender was secondary, but I was thinking about what others were thinking of me. So that's kind of where I kind of continue that ethos to this point now. So I've been fortunate to still play, um, still make music, raise a family, 
um, do stuff like this, meet amazing people all over the world, and really have a great time kind of uh, straddling the worlds of art and commerce. I'm really, really fortunate for that. Thank you, Vanessa. Heather, thank you so much. I, what you just said is a really good segue into the next question and part of this conversation. When you brought up musical trauma, you know, part of the whole concept behind Decompress comes from my experiences of being a, a direct action activist right here in Miami and all over the world and being able to decompress at clubs. And I've, I've been to clubs all over the world, like just because I'm chasing after house and techno and a sound that is my inheritance. But I've had to experience a lot <laughs> in navigating these, to, to get there and navigating these spaces and hence creating a space of my own where I can go here and where we can welcome people who are like me and everybody. So, you know, the next question is, how has black people been erased <laughs> from their role in shaping electronic music? And what, if, what has your experiences been in navigating that, dealing with that, and also resisting that? Well, it's interesting because... This is for everybody as well, too. Yeah, Go I'm, ahead. You, you can start off. <laughs> yeah, I'll start, and then I'll try to make it quick. But, but the, my experience right. with um, black music or techno or just dance music in general, as I've seen it portrayed in black communities and how there's been eras of, of dance music that has... Um, it's this interesting dichotomy where at a certain point it's kind of split where you have people who prefer a certain sound that is what they describe as disco or deep house, which is really, um, a deep house is really disco, meaning that it's like literally from house music, house parties, and it would be like the soulful side of, of cuts. And then as it transformed into something a little faster um, and how more people who weren't of color experienced these different um, versions of said music and how it's still, there's kind of still a split today in different cities, you can see that, where people have a feeling that if something that's a little faster, they kind of decry it as being that techno, but they don't understand really the definition of techno for them. So it's still in that really weird space sometimes, and I think we're figuring out, as we're trying to make people aware of its origins, that people are becoming black people as well as other people of other colors, nationalities, are understanding the origins of dance music. Am I allowed to uh, skip to somebody else I could think about the question more? Yeah, of course. Okay, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanna say, in my experience, I feel like, I see um, currently there's this like, there's, I don't know how to, um, what you call this, but I see that in house music, techno, or different genres, like I watch Boiler Rooms, I watch a lot of people's sets, I, I go to a lot of DJ sets here in Miami, and I feel like other races are allowed to borrow from um, us a lot, like, you know, in a sense of like hip hop samples and whatever it may be, and whenever we try to do the same thing, we get told we don't fit the room. And these are real experiences that I've had. I've, I've been told that I don't fit the room or um, what I'm doing is too like extreme. But when I, like the other day I saw some, I saw a boiler room and they were playing like Little Uzi. And, but like there wasn't a black person in the room. And then it was like Little Uzi at the rave. But it was like, it kind of was just, um, it's just really bizarre because like, I feel like we don't ever get to borrow from other genres. Like we, it just gets taken from us and then we get told how to like conform into that um, space. So like I'm currently trying to figure out how to break out of this space. Um, I'm not sure what, what the answer is or like where to go with it, but that's currently what I'm experiencing right now is that like, I'm having this issue with people borrowing so much and not acknowledging that they're borrowing 
or that we are bringing something new to the genre. So. How to follow that up. Um, you know, there, for me, there, there are two sides of it. I've been through that, I go through that. I mean, I'm, I'm still very relevant. I still play, I still make music. Um, playing here at home has always been really tough. And you know, you, you kind of inferred something, but I, I, I think I want to be a little bit more explicit with it, where a lot of times it was, you know, strike, we like you. You're, you're a good guy, you're talented. Yeah, you, but you don't really, you don't really fit, the, fit the thing we're trying to do. Well, what is it you're trying to do? Uh, we're trying to bring underground techno to this club. That's what I do. So how exactly, you know, I'm not saying I'm the best or whatever, there's plenty of great talent here, but I belong. Um, so why don't I belong? So that was, that's been a thing. Uh, that's been a thing that's driven me to therapy. That's been a thing that's caused me to doubt myself. It's been a thing that uh, causes me to fear for my daughter when I started a family. But, and there's a but there, I don't care at the end of the day. I'm old enough now. I'm old enough now to know better. That doesn't mean I'm not still scared or worry or, you know, we all want to play. We're performers, we're entertainers, we are, we're, you know, this is what, this is in our DNA. We want to be able to do that and, 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 and give that and share that. So when we're not able to, it's, it's, it's weird. And then, you know, the, the words that people use to hide behind what the thing really is, it can be really shocking and not shocking at the same time. But the but I wanted to give you, you know, my, my dear friend George Del Rey is here. Now, George, stand up. George is clearly not black. <laughs> but this man right here, I mean, he'll, he'll tell you a, a trillion stories about little shy strike, little shy Greg. This guy always tell, told me, you belong. You're supposed to do what you're supposed to be doing and do that. And he helped me, help enable me to, to do those things. A lot of my, a lot of the records that kind of defined my career were made in his garage. And with his instruments, with his computer. So my, my point is, you know, it's important, first of all, to understand that you're absolutely valid. You're trying to, there's nothing for you to figure out. Do the damn thing, like do the thing. You're doing it. Continue to do it. I love, by the way, love what you guys do. Love what you guys, I don't go out very much, <laughs> but uh, I love what you guys do. Heather, I've been a fan since, I can't, well, I'll tell you a story about me going to jail in, uh, in Chicago once. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that one later. But one of my first questions when I first got to Chicago was, where can I go see Heather play? That is literally one of the first questions I asked. So, you know, you do the damn thing, but also realize that whatever your community is, you know, feel empowered by that and feel enabled by that and be a part of that. Enable others as well. So everything, George, that you did for me, I am doing my very best to pay that forward. You, and you also, I think, <laughs> there were times when I felt that George was way more black than I was. <laughs> because he got it, he got it. He, and he saw the frustration, he saw the pain, he saw the hurt, he saw all of that. And also didn't know what to necessarily do with it other than I'm here for your brother, go make some music, because, or you know, let me go throw a party, let me throw a party and you play. And we get a bunch of DJs that are just good Black, yellow, pink, yellow, you know, whatever. They're all gonna play. So you, you just have to kind of do that and know that, you know, these things exist, but, and it's gonna be hard. I mean, there were times, I tell this story a lot to my wife, and I, I think I've even mentioned it to my daughter, there were times where I didn't have any money because of that, because of you don't fit the room, which basically is you're too black to play here. And I had to figure out who's gonna eat today, me or my dog? That's a thing. That happened, so very traumatic, something I deal with today, even though, you know, doing just fine, but that is something that resonates daily, daily, daily. At the same time it resonates daily, it's also what also resonates is, I don't care. And I am responsible for the, the art that I'm making for myself, for others, so just do that. That's it. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective because I've been uh, battling. This week has been a crazy week, honestly. Um, 
for people in our community. Um, I started off as a, a producer first. So when we started Paper Water, um, we're a little bit naive that we're like, oh, we're, you know, we're producers. We're gonna like DJ and everyone's just gonna accept this and uh, like we're gonna do original music and play other people's music, everyone's gonna play it and everyone in Miami is gonna be a happy family and be like, this is our scene, this is beautiful. It didn't happen like that, it was uh, uh, World War III. And uh, the don't fit in the room thing has been hard on me because it's like a, a, like a gaslight experience because for me, I've taught people that aren't black or brown um, how to DJ and they will do like our style and they'll go on to boiler room and then they'll say they fit the room and then literally talk to our agent and be like, you guys don't fit the room. And I'm like, how? Right. <laughs> like how we don't. And um, hearing you say, you know, you don't care is like, I'm doing this because I enjoy it. I think that's uh, the definition of an artist is uh, really expressing like everything you went through, whether it's sonically, lyrically, and uh, presenting it to the people and like powering through it and not still trying to figure it out uh, as I uh, talk at this panel right now. And um, I don't know, I have a lot of like resentment actually about it, like currently. It's real. Yeah, I have a lot of resentment. Um, sometimes I feel like quitting, sometimes I feel like, you know, going in a different genre and it's a it's really weird how um classes uh dance music is yeah 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 oh, I was gonna say pertaining to your point about classist mm -hmm. racist uh, it's about um packaging you know you can go back to Elvis you can go back to Jamiroquai being the Stevie, you can go back to JT being Usher, whatever, however you want to repackage it, when people see it in that way, it's quote unquote presentable and more pal palatable. Mm -hmm. So that's why you, that's what you see reflected in the lineup. So mm -hmm. whether it be Boiler Room, I'm a, a, a veteran of two, two of them. And the first time I played one, it felt very organic. It was like the first time that you had a, a situation where it was new, so it was just presenting um, a particular highlight of a city or whatever, and these are the DJs they want to present. And in that moment, I didn't feel anything, but this was about showing out for my city. It was a Chicago versus Detroit event. Super fun, and that's what I was focusing on, and it felt very multicultural. It felt very, still very underground. Fast forward to now, and it, you see the commercial aspect of it. You see that it is really more driven by branding and that's another portion of the, or another element of dance music that is really kind of become um, problematic to a certain extent where, but you also have an influx of artists who are trying to get on too. There's just so much happening at, at this time that it can feel frustrating and you can feel like you're, people are telling you're not the right fit but that's not the point. The point is that you continue to do you because people will respond to you, your honesty, your if your ethos, how you conduct yourself. And it's, it's by osmosis. It's not anything you have to necessarily yell from a microphone that you're doing. It's just continue to do you because I've been doing this now. This is my 34th year of DJing, which mm -hmm. is wild, Woo! which is wild. And I never thought, thank you, I never thought I would be making a living from it because it wasn't necessarily something that was considered a, a job or career. It was always parallel to everything else I was doing, whether it was retail, working for music, working for labels, distribution companies, being a fan, being literally a punter at a show. It was always parallel to what my experiences were. And then all, all of a sudden, it just kind of took over. And every time I fed the beast, the beast got bigger. And sometimes there was not enough to feed the beast, so it got smaller. But I've always been, um, my perpetual carrot has been the joy that it brings me, the itch that I have to scratch, mm -hmm. you know? Because for me, it at the end of the day, it no one else matters. It's about how you feel. And as you get, dare I say, older, 
you really start not caring about anyone else. Yeah. But that also can happen at any point in your career. Because mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I, I still don't think of this as being a career. It's still that accident that I'm... The passion. The passion yeah. that keeps me going. And then maybe it will stop, maybe it won't. You know, there's DJs. But then you can talk about, we can talk about gender. There's a whole other, mm -hmm. you know, door we can go through. And you talk about how people consider DJs of a certain age, it's quote unquote more acceptable to be a male DJ in their 60s as opposed to a woman, a female DJ in, you know, in her mid 50s. Like what is this, it shouldn't be any different as long as the skill set is there, the passion is there, but that's how we are. We're, there's just so much stuff that is mixed up in dance music where you see societal problems or issues manifested in how people are um, perceived in dance music. So all those things that you touched on are mm -hmm. part of it too. Anna, thank you. Actually, yeah. That's interesting because yeah, I feel like um, a lot of people forgot dance music supposed to be the genre that everyone could be together. You could be like trance, you could be hood drug dealer, you could be white, whatever. that you could all dance together. So that's been like the clusterfuck, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. So um, I'm really glad that uh, Data for Black Lives is here because you don't know, you know, you live here, but it's very lonely. It's basically like, it feels like um, doing electronic dance music in, in Miami is like being on a deserted island yeah. with Ableton. What's up with um, dance music itself in Miami as it pertains to Miami specifically? Well, Miami. Because, because, oh sorry, mm -hmm. I was going to say because um, from outsider looking in, there's like all the, the mix of cultures forever and then you have like the hip hop that's here, bass music that's here, like all of those flavors, but you're telling me that dance music is an island that you're on with Ableton. So it's like, let me know Eddie if I mess up, you could jump in. So let's say for the idea, paper water is a duo, but the idea of paper water is the idea of like everyone coming together. And so Miami is a melting pot, mm -hmm. but let's say when someone does an ama piano party is is segregated. When someone does a reggaeton party, it's segregated. If uh, the Dominicans are doing a party, it's segregated. And it's like being paid for artists looking at it, it's like, did you know that we're all kind of like really related? Yeah. And we could all enjoy all of this together and like it's an opportunity uh, for people to just enjoy it. And so sometimes Miami, especially Miami being in America, feels like the capital city of like South America and the Caribbean mm -hmm. and like a direct mm -hmm. flight from Europe. So it, it has like, <laughs> it has like that type of vibe, mm -hmm. but I feel like they're not utilizing it. And then the dancing here is very classes and when they do try to be inclusive, they get like celebrity black people to, uh, to come here. And a lot of the up and coming people are very like much excluded. Even, even white and white passing Hispanics are kind of excluded because even though they do get the slots, they get like the lower slots. And it almost handicaps the entire scene in Miami up and talent in a way that overall Miami ends up not having a sound, which our whole mission is to be like, hey, Miami has like a crazy sound and we're all just kind of being whores to brands. And when something comes in, everyone like jumps on that instead of being like, hey, everything's already here and it's like very frustrating. And sometimes, you know, I'll feel like I'm not good enough and I'll be like, you know, why am I doing this for, or like, what's the point of it? So, I don't know. I went to Detroit. We went to Detroit to Movement Festival. And that was like a, 
rebuy. Yeah. yeah, we got like re-energy and then we came back here and we're like, damn, this is kind of like not it. And then we got <laughs> we got hit up by you and you're like, yeah, I'm doing a nonprofit, you know, to using music to like create social change, specifically electronic music. And I was like, well, you're the nonprofit for us. So <laughs> this is why we're here. So just trying to figure it out. Thank you so much. I was hoping that you all would speak back and forth, and that's exactly what I wanted. I don't know, Greg or Eddie, if you wanted to chime in as well. I know I got Cynthia to show me it's five minutes left, and we do want to have time for the audience to ask questions. We also have a celebratory toast that we're going to do as well. But any, I mean, anything else on that topic? And if people have questions, start thinking of them. Oh, okay, I already see the hands. Cynthia, you see the hands? <laughs> so yeah, maybe let's, um, uh, Greg and, and, and Eddie, if you want to chime in, and we can get a couple questions. So, yeah. Oof. We're going to need like 20 more panels to get through so much it's of this. It's a series, so. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that, this, this, is, this is precisely why rave culture is a thing. It's a, you know, the, the whole DIY thing. I mean, you guys, <laughs> I was doing a dad joke in my mind, I won't even say it out loud, but you guys carry a lot of weight. You don't, you don't realize it, maybe, or you're trying to figure it out, but I'm telling you, you yes. carry weight here. Yes. Okay? So use that. Like, you know, I, of course, yes, money's always a thing, but the whole data thing, like, as I hear you, as I'm hearing this, I'm like, yeah, yeah, and then I'm realizing, oh, what you guys are fighting you know, of course there's racism. I just said the word, racism. I said it, that's a thing. But you guys are also fighting the corporate structure in Miami of clubs and all of that. That's a big thing. But, and I love that the fact that it, I, can, I, I, can, I get to say that word, but, you know, you've got you and you. You guys have the power, you carry the weight to create your own events, headline your own events. It's not your ego. That's your right. You you have the ability. I, I get I get it. It takes money. It takes. But you know you. I guarantee you. I know you guys have a community of people around you that. Hey, I've got some speakers. I've got a mixer. Now you have a venue. Now you've got a venue. So <laughs> use that. Use that. Like use that. One thing I just wanted to share very quickly, uh, because you know, a lot of this is, is is surrounding like you know the invisible or the visible enemy. You know the the the, the thing that we're fighting. And I've been a martial artist most of my life. I started training when I was 12. Around the same time, I started DJing. And uh, there's a, this tattoo I have here. It's uh, Japanese, and it's from my, my master. Well, not my master, but one of the, the arts that I study, uh, Aikido. And it says, Masakatsu Agatsu. And what it means in English, very roughly translated, is true victory is victory over oneself. So we're responsible. There's always going to be a barrier, a person, people, things that are in front of you. Uh, they're not, you know, I mean, they can be the enemy, but truly, 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 what we, the, the, the decision I make, the decision we make, that's the thing. We are our own opponent, so we have to figure out a way to overcome whatever that is. That's simply an obstacle at the end of the day. Now, I know I'm kind of preaching, I don't mean to, but that's the way I, I'm really, I, I know exactly what you guys are going through. I, st I mean, I, I, I still go through that. I still, I still want to play the same venues you guys want to play, and I'm not. But, but, I'm figuring out a way to make my own way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is for these two. Um, did you go to Movement this year? So what, when you went to this your first time to Detroit? Yeah. And how did you feel when all you hear is old oh, Detroit you're gonna walk down the street, you're gonna get shot, but you were inspired by the music though, weren't you? Oh, man, it was amazing. It's night and day, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. people were so welcoming, it felt like a family. Uh, it also, like we met Wajib there, and like it, being able to connect with him oh, yeah, and see what he was building there was like another, oh. It was, um, yeah, it was just an amazing experience to see how close-knit Detroit is, how welcoming they are. Um, all the history that is based there, how hip hop and techno aren't that really far apart, even though people make they're them. Connected. Yeah, they're connected. They're made by the same people. So it's really cool. I got one quick one. Yeah. So I'm from Michigan, and I've been down living here in 18, 18 years. 
I would rather go to movement because it's a lot better music than going to ultra. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yes. The thing is, you can go to Detroit and you will be more accepted up there than coming down to movement because it's so segregated down here yeah. and it's in plain sight and it makes me sick. <laughs> well, to that point about movement versus ultra, I was just having a conversation with Milo who was lovely enough to give me a ride here today or tonight and we were talking about how the difference from pre-ultra, which was um, the Winter Music Conference and that was really welcoming and open because the venues were smaller, the corporate side of it hadn't really taken over, and it was you had an influx of people from Detroit, Chicago, all over Florida coming down here, Europe, etc., and how records literally got broke here. So you first time you hear um, music sound better with you, you know, it's the only time that people had white labels of it, that kind of thing. So major, it was like a conference. It really felt like the music side of it, and you were in a bubble that was exclusive stuff and seeing DJs that were huge walking down the street, Goldie's down the street or Louis Vega, you know, and Ultra, because of the economic boon that it brought, changed everything. And then now you have, um, what is it, Miami Music Week, and it's still on that corporate tip. And going back to movement, which used to be DMF, it's definitely has a, of a corporate side to it but it's gone really back down to basics because I was there this past year and it felt like it was already back. But I think you can also throw that sense of being back because we're post-pandemic. We really feel like it's tw three years out. Everyone's ready to like forget about what's going on in the world and have a chance to really have a good time. So that's why I want to just kind of bring those Thank you. comparisons. Another thing I noticed with movement, they kind of embraced hip hop. Like I saw banners that it was like techno and hip hop f festival, which I think Ultra doesn't really do. So I, I felt like movement's more like the entire city of Detroit being activated musically because we're outside more than actually at the festival. So, yes. yeah. My question, it's like I hear a lot of what y'all are saying and as someone who also plays music and is like getting into it more and is from Florida. I'm mostly from Tampa, but I've been living here for a minute too. It's just like disheartening to hear in some ways. And I totally understand like how much so many like amazing black DJs, artists want to leave. And okay, sorry. I'm just like, oh, um, because it's kind of maybe a little bit of a heavy question too, but I'm curious as to like, what would it feel like, what do you think, just so everyone also here could know like, what it would feel like to kind of, what do you think Miami needs to be able to have more of a resistance of like underground black music? Because I feel similarly to everything that y'all are saying and I also have thought about leaving. I'm constantly thinking about it so many other people I know too, and it's sad because I'm like, I feel like in my mind, Miami makes so much sense that it, it has so many things, but it just doesn't work out. And I think like the corporate piece makes a lot of sense too. Um, space, so much stuff, like just like the lack of access to space. But you know, I'm here right now and I wanna see Miami have its time again. And so I'm just like curious what it would feel like for y'all to be like taken care of and feel like the city, like this is your fucking city. You know what I'm saying? Like I just, yeah. yeah. So. I left, I, I lived, I, I signed to a major label. I went, I was living in Paris. I was living in Germany, touring a ton. And I came, I came back. Why did I come back? <laughs> I came back because this is my city. <laughs> It's my city. This is your city. Yeah. You know, it's your city. This is Everyone's ours. City. So this is what we need. You know, the thing, you know, what do we need to resist is to resist, <laughs> is to get up and go and do the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you all want to have any final thoughts and any 
That was such a wonderful question. Thank you. That was actually going to be my last question. And before we toast to this new space, to this new project, and let's talk about resistance and not letting obstacles. I'm so thankful to my team, Chelsea, from Data for Black Lives. I'm so thankful to everybody who has supported us and helped us to this point. And it has been a feat in even building this space, but every minute has been worth it and we are not stopping. So any final thoughts that you all wanna share before we toast to the space and then we transform this panel into a club for Greg's set. <laughs> Final thoughts? This is our city, and we're taking it back. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's Heather. I appreciate y'all having me here. <laughs> She's being humble. Um, I just want to say I love y'all for coming out here for Juneteenth. Um, there, there's a severe thunderstorm. That's what my uh, GPS told me today. Yes. And you came out here. Thank you. To do that. It was, and GPS was invented by a black woman. Sure was. Uh, that well. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a crazy fact. It's true. So, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. The fact that y'all came out here in the rain, um, let's just have some fun. Woo. Thank you. Thank and you. Shout out to Yeshi. Yes. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. I thank you all for being here. And I also want to acknowledge the people who couldn't be here. Shy Boy, unfortunately, due to weather, wasn't able to join us, but I am wearing my Disc Woman hat to represent. Shout out to Disc Woman for holding it down hey. for so long. Um, and also, shout out to the people who have passed. Um, one of the people that I was so excited to reconnect with over this event and creating amazing merch, my very good friend Danny Agnew, yes. passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. And we were just talking about files and this project and getting some new merch out and just like that. And it reminds us of the fragility of life, the impermanence of it, and it, a call to action for us to love and care for each other in the moments and the time that we have. So in our tradition, I'll <laughs> pour a little bit out for everybody that we've lost and Ashe. Toast, everybody. Cheers. Thank you for being Cheers. here. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Rest, <laughs> Thank rest you all standing. for speaking and for your incredible work. Let's party. <laughs> Woo!